Welcome to the show. I am James Swanick. Imagine if you had no more wasted days. No more wasted days. How many days have we wasted because of our drinking? Even if it's just a couple of seemingly innocent glasses of wine at the end of the day, we still wake up feeling a little irritable, a little foggy, a little distracted. We still procrastinate, don't we? And our days can feel wasted. A lot of us are also drinking a lot more than two drinks a day. Might be a bottle, a bottle of wine, a bottle and a half. Then we wake up foggy and irritable. And it just feels like the day gets away from us, doesn't it? Today, we're talking to a guest by the name of Sarah Kaufman Bradstreet, who has a program that, that is actually called No More Wasted Days. And Sarah helps people take a 30-day break from alcohol. You can find her on Instagram and TikTok at no underscore more underscore wasted underscore days. It's a bit of a mouthful. No more wasted days with underscores separating each word. Sarah, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Tell us a little bit about your alcohol-free lifestyle journey, Sarah. So I quit drinking a little over three and a half years ago, and I didn't really see it coming. I was a drinker who I was at that point with my drinking where I had actually tried to take breaks, had tried to quit drinking, had tried to moderate so many times and failed that I had kind of settled into the idea that I was just a drinker and it was who I was. And I was kind of owning that personality as best I could. And one day my husband said, I think I want to take a break from drinking and I think I might quit altogether. And I was, I was sidelined to say the least. I was like, what am I supposed to do then? Cause we were drinking buddies and I was just kind of like, uh, I, okay, well, I went back and forth. Like, am I going to quit with them? What am I doing? How am I going to do this? And I thought, well, I'll, I'll stop just for 30 days. I was really convinced that if I could quit for 30 days, it could prove that one, I didn't have a drinking problem because in my mind, people that had a drinking problem couldn't quit for 30 days. You couldn't just stop. Um, and I could also then kind of see what life would be like without alcohol. I was at a place where all I knew was a life with alcohol. So I finally took the break and this time somehow I stuck to it and I will be a hundred percent honest. I didn't, I didn't intend to stick to it. I intended to kind of go along with my husband and say, sure, I'll do 30 days with you. And I was thinking we'd make it seven or less. And then I could talk him into drinking. But something clicked with both of us. And we both started seeing all the benefits of being alcohol free. And that life without hangovers was this amazing thing. We were both getting so much done. We were both so much more productive, so much more creative. And then we just kind of kept it going. I got to the end of 30 days and I knew if I went back to drinking after 30 days, it would just be the exact same thing it was. I knew I wasn't far enough to be like, oh, now I'm in control. So I just kept going and, and kind of the same thing at 60 days, knowing I can't go back. And then at some point, just knowing it wasn't worth it to go back anymore. I It wasn't worth living a life with alcohol when the life without alcohol was so amazing. What was life with alcohol uh, for you that made you believe that life with alcohol was so amazing? It was my, it had become my only hobby and it had become the only thing I really did for fun. When people would ask me, what do you do for fun? I would, it would, depending on the person, I would have to search for either a false hobby and just lie. Or if I knew the person I thought well enough, I would just say, oh, my hobby's drinking in the sun. Like I was just flat out, like, that's my favorite thing to do. That's what I love to do. But on the outside, it looked really great. And I could say that and people would laugh. But on the inside, I had so many hangovers. I was going to work hungover sometimes. I was spending most of my weekends either hungover or drinking and drinking excessively on the weekends. And it had become a habit where I was doing it daily by the end. So it was it was a bit of a train wreck, but on the outside, it didn't look like a train wreck at all. If you were to just be looking at me from the outside, you saw a mom who got her kids to school on time and you saw a teacher who was going to work every day and it looked great. We had a great house. We had, we had like the American dream, the quote unquote American dream going on on the outside. But on the inside, I was, I was worried about my drinking. I was confused about my drinking and I was just, I was hurting. And the blackouts were becoming this, and it was just an endless cycle of blackout, hangover, rinse, repeat, and it was just becoming a train wreck. Did somebody else see this and say something to you? No, nobody else said anything to me. And my husband was in it with me because, and so we were just, and all of our friends were drinkers too. 
and they were kind of the, you know, the, the quote unquote normal drinkers. So it just didn't seem, it just didn't seem weird to anybody. And it, and I think even too, I would tell people sometimes like, you know, I think I drink too much and they would go, Oh no, not you. You're, you're fine. And I think it's almost that dependency of drinkers on each other. Like, Oh, don't start saying you've got a problem. Cause then I've got to start thinking I've got a problem too. So what do you think people mean when they say, Oh, you've got a problem or maybe I've got a problem. Like, what do they think? the What do they think that point is exactly? I think. I think so many people, I know I was waiting for what they talk about as a rock bottom moment. I was waiting for something like a DUI. I was waiting for something to happen in my marriage or something to happen. Like I would always kind of go through a mental checklist in my head. I haven't gotten a DUI. I still have my job. My marriage is healthy and happy. My kids are healthy and happy. And when I would go through that checklist, I'd be like, it's not a problem. It's not affecting any other part of my life. But it totally was like on the it 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 was in these really small ways. But I think I was waiting for this really big thing to happen to me. And the big thing never came, or it no. did come. It never came. Yeah, the big thing that you thought was the big thing never came. But in actual fact, the big thing was probably already happening. It was just death by a thousand cuts, or it was like this maybe mostly invisible drift that was taking place until you identified it as possibly being a big thing after the fact. Exactly. I feel like once I was out of it, I was able to go, oh my God, it was like, it was a million little things, but it was also a huge thing. It was it, like, I always tell people, yeah, I still had my kids, but I didn't because I wasn't present with them. And yeah, I still had a happy, healthy marriage, marriage, but I didn't because when we quit drinking, it became our bond became so much stronger with each other. And it's just kind of the same with everything. I could say like, oh, I was a great teacher. I wasn't. I was a half-assed teacher. (laughs) I was like, it was all just these these little tiny things that you couldn't see it, but you could also justify to keep yourself drinking, if that makes sense. How did you justify continuing to drink? I think it was, for me, it was always the, as long as I can keep my job, as long as I can keep my kids getting to school on time, And as long as it's just still fun, I was always told I was a really fun drunk. And that's something that stuck with me. Like, oh, you're a fun drunk. Well, I don't want to lose that, right? (laughs) I don't want people to stop thinking that I'm not fun. But I could could justify it in so many different ways. And I could even say like, oh, on the weekdays, I don't drink as much. On the weekends, I drink a lot, but that's okay because it's the weekends. And it's it was just, I I could get myself in an endless loop to justify my drinking. Mm. Now, you mentioned that your husband initially said he was going to stop and then you got on board with that. So you didn't even make the choice to halt this behavior on your own. Your husband actually was the catalyst for this. Yeah, we definitely both talked about it a lot, but he was the one that finally said, you know, I think I'm really done. I think I've got to take a break. And we had definitely had, it was snowballing. And I think he could kind of see it too. Like it's just becoming more and more and more. And there's no amount of alcohol where we say enough is enough. And I think that he could see that there was something different on the other side. And I really couldn't. And and it's so funny because the times where I would talk about quitting drinking were always when I was drunk. I would be drunk and I would be telling my husband, like, I think I got to quit drinking. I'm drinking too much. And then the next day I would be like, you're totally fine. (laughs) Why are you even thinking that thought? And it's just, but I am forever thankful that he actually thought, okay, enough is enough. Let's, let's, let's quit or take a break. Or I, and he always said it too, like, I'm going to, I don't care. Whatever you do is up to you. But it was very much like, well, if he's going to do it, I'm not just going to sit around and drink a bottle of wine every night by myself. And so what did your friends say in those first 60 days or so, first 90 days, when you oh, informed them that you were taking a break? At the time, you thought it was a break, right? You didn't realize it was going to go on for coming up a few years or, or coming up four years. So what did they say? Um, I had mixed responses, but most most people, because I kept saying, you know, it's just a break. I'm taking a break. I'm seeing what it's like without alcohol. Um, for those people. I think that they could accept it that way, 
but as friends were starting to see that I just wasn't drinking, there were a few times where people were like, really, you're not going to drink where I'd be going on a vacation with friends. And I'd say, oh yeah, I'm still, I'm still taking a break. And I remember one trip that I took right around. I knew I was going to hit 75 days on the trip. And so I was like, there's no way I'm drinking on this trip because that number is too big and I've got to get there. And I remember friends going, oh, you mean you're not even going to drink on the trip? I figured you were still going to like drink, but just a little bit. I'm like, N-. and I looked at my friends and I said, no way. Like I'm getting to day 75. And you could tell they, they were like, so, <laughs> and I was so like, I am on this path. This is awesome. And I was really quiet about the changes I was feeling. I didn't, I never wanted to make anybody else feel bad by my, my feeling so good, I guess. And I also didn't know what I was doing. So I couldn't, I couldn't really answer it a hundred percent for friends because there was this piece of me that kept saying, well, I might go back to drinking, but for now I'm not. And I think when I finally said I'm not drinking, it wasn't too much of a shock to friends because they had been watching me slowly change and evolve on the process. But the the initial, I would definitely get some pushback. Like, oh, I don't think you really need to take a break. Oh, I think you're doing okay. Mm-hmm. It's funny how we humans want to keep latching on to the status quo, isn't it? It's like, and the idea of change is like, oh, well, the idea that stopping drinking means that there's some kind of problem. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, it's, it's like the idea is like, if you, oh, Sarah's decided to stop drinking for 75 days oh she must have a problem (laughs) as opposed to the people who are going to continue drinking for 75 days (laughs) well and i think too it definitely makes people stop and reflect on their own drinking and especially people who you know they knew they were drinking just as much as me and i know that it makes them stop and kind of go oh well she's quitting maybe i need to do something and and that was part of my like i didn't want to get into that with anybody early on cuz i was still like i don't know where i'm going with this i just know i feel good so i'm going to keep it going and i was very much a person who did not want to have a label put on me i didn't want to be a person with a drinking problem i didn't want to be an alcoholic i just wanted to quietly quit drinking and be left alone about it Mm. What were the benefits and the changes that you experienced during those first few months? Oh my gosh, I feel like they were so many. I feel like those first the first few months are like the best. <laughs> and sometimes I'm always like, oh, I wish I could get back to that. But it's I mean, it's still good, obviously. But I was so much more creative. Um, in my work, I was just able to to bust out things that I wasn't able to before that were really a big struggle to slog through writing emails and doing other things. I was finally able to sit down and just do the work. The focus was amazing. My energy levels were so boosted and I was already a really energetic person. Like, I don't think anybody was looking at me going, Oh, Sarah doesn't do anything because that wasn't the truth, but I just felt amazing. And Like I started losing belly bloat. I started losing puffiness in my face, which I really didn't see until I started looking at pictures. And I started, my skin just started glowing. It was just, I don't know. It was just an amazing process of kind of feeling like you were alive after not being a hundred percent alive. Feeling alive after not feeling a hundred percent being alive. I was thinking of that Saturday Night Fever song, "Staying Alive, Staying Alive." Ah, yeah. uh, 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 you know. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I experienced something similar when I stopped drinking. I had clarity and focus, and I slept better, which in turn gave me greater energy and reduced my stress and anxiety, which in turn didn't make me want to crave an alcoholic drink. Is that what you experienced? Yeah, totally. And my sleep—that's one thing I forgot to mention—is my sleep improved really fast. I talked to some people, and they say it takes a while. But I was able to sleep through the night, which was not a normal thing for me. I had become a person who would always wake up at like 2 or 3 a.m. and just be laying in bed stressing about little things, little teeny tiny things. But I couldn't get back to sleep then. And it was just, it was awful. I remember going into work every Monday just feeling miserable because I didn't sleep all Sunday night. I just laid in bed and stewed. And when Monday started coming and I wasn't drinking anymore, I would walk into work and actually be like, I'm ready. Like I actually use the weekend for resting and productivity and all the things you're supposed to use it for. And 
it was just amazing. And I do feel like the pluses were so big that it made it easy to say no to alcohol. Mm. Yeah, I I love going to bed early on a Friday and Saturday night and waking up with the anticipation of Saturday and Sunday morning. I love that feeling. So yeah. uh, a lot of times, I've been spending a lot of time in Medellin, Colombia, um, in recent uh, in recent time. And every Sunday, they have this thing called Cicla Via, where they block off the main road called Avenida Poblado, and they open it up to cyclists, joggers, walkers, families. They have a little street street um, stalls and things like that. And Saturday night, I go out for dinner, usually with friends. I stay up a little bit later um, than I might ordinarily. I'm always alcohol-free. Have a great time. Maybe I go to sleep a bit later around 11 or maybe midnight, but probably 11, 11.30. But I go to bed completely alcohol-free. And when I wake up in the morning, or sorry, just before I go to sleep, I'm like, oh, yeah, tomorrow morning I'm going to get up and I'm going to run Ciclavia. And so I get up and put my gym clothes on and I go down and I run along the street, which ordinarily is just bursting with cars and trucks and traffic and is completely hectic. But on a Sunday morning at about 8 a.m., it's just gorgeously calm and quiet and there are some families and and that anticipation of of doing that and enjoying that i start feeling that on saturday night and it helps me make good choices not just choices around not drinking alcohol but good dietary choices in terms of i don't really want to have this ice cream or sugary treat tonight because i'm going to have a sugar hangover the next morning before i go to run at ciclavia so it's a good little hack that i seem to have stumbled upon which is feel the excitement of the morning after or feel the excitement of the next morning and that dictates my behavior the night before does that can you relate to that or i can totally relate to you that you saying that makes me just be like that's that describes it perfectly because I still, I feel like I have that even on the weekdays, like I'll go to bed just being like, okay, alarm's going to go off at 445. I always give myself the pre pep talk before I go to bed and I'm going to bust out of bed and I'm going to be so ready to do my morning routine and it's going to be awesome. And, and I wake up and it is like, I do a meditation in the morning, I write my journal and then do a quick workout. And it's like, something that I look forward to so much and something that I tried to tackle when I was a drinker and could never make happen because I was too hungover and, or, you know, not even hungover, sometimes just tired. It was still just a mild hangover, but Mm. it's, it just feels so good. And Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings, the coffee is so good. Like that's always my thing. I'm like, the coffee is so worth it to not drink the night before. And the coffee is no longer this thing that's just giving me life. That's how I used to look at it when I was a drinker. Like, I have to drink this because I'm hungover and it's going to give me the little boost of caffeine I need to just get my body going. Now it's like this this awesome ritual that I get to have. And just, and I love to, like how you were saying, you go out and you run or you, it's like, you can go out and go do whatever you want to do now. And that, and the hangover is not holding you back. It's an amazing gift. Mm. I follow an English soccer team called Tottenham Hotspur. And because I'm in Medellin, Colombia on an East Coast of US time zone, the games that are taking place over in the UK tend to happen mostly at about 10 a.m. Eastern time, 10 a.m. Medellin time, mostly, or they can sometimes be 11 a.m. or sometimes uh, if it's a night game, 3 p.m. But most of the games start Medellin time around 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. And the anticipation of watching my team on the TV or on my um, Peacock TV app on my phone at 10 a.m. or 11 a.m., usually on a Saturday or Sunday, depending on what game they're playing, also gives me this amazing feeling the night before. It's like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to go and exercise. I'm going to go run or go to the gym. And then I'm going to time my run. What time does the game start? The game starts at 10. Okay, so that means I'm going to leave for the gym at 7.30. I'm going to do the workout from 8 to 9. I'll be back by 9.20, shower, change and clothes. I'll have breakfast 9.30 and then bang, game starts at 10. Perfect. And then I'll watch the game. And as long as my team's winning, it's a perfect, perfect (laughs) morning. And if my team loses, well, it's an almost perfect morning. But that anticipation... And then, and sorry, just to go back on that, and if Tottenham's playing on Ciclavia, which is on the Sunday, 
then I still do the Ciclavir. I, ju- I enjoy the run and I get back and I shower and then I watch the game. And then sometimes Ciclavir doesn't finish until 1 p.m. I'll go back down to Ciclavir at noon after the Tottenham game and then just walk along um, and see all the families and the people walking dogs. And it makes me feel really, you know, part of a community and just nice to see that, you know, as opposed to on those occasions where I've been out the night before in Medellin or in other cities at 11 30 or 12, it's like, wow, the crazies come out. It's like, it's just a completely different energy of drunk people, sketchy looking people, um, dangerous energy, um, you know what I mean? So it's it's yeah. it's like the anticipation of that beautiful family, friendly, accomplished health, doing something that I love, like watching my team, being amongst nice people and enjoying a Sunday morning, man, and drinking a cup of coffee. Wow, that's gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like there was a gosh, there was something I was gonna say to piggyback off of that. And I totally the the idea slipped because I was like, oh my gosh, it's just such an amazing weekend. Oh, I was gonna say. It's the, like, you get so much done, you get so much accomplished that you couldn't accomplish. And a lot of it too is like amazing things. Cause I have people ask like, so you just kind of spend the weekends doing chores or just productive. And I was like, well, I'm productive, but I also relax. Like how you're saying you also watch your game. You also do something you truly enjoy. Sometimes I just sit and I watch three YouTube, like three Netflix episodes and I don't feel bad about it because I already woke up and worked out and did so much stuff have laundry going on the side. Like it's just kind of amazing. Whereas the weekends before were just survival mode or just starting to drink again to take away the hangover. What Netflix episodes are you watching, Sarah? Come on, let's do a TV oh, series review. Tell me. <laughs> I'm, you got? I'm more I'm more on Hulu right now. And we're just we're wrapping up the patient with um Stephen Crow and it's really good. We're almost done with that one. And then we just watched The Bear on Hulu as well. And that one's really good. They're both 30 minute episodes, which I really like because you can watch them while you eat lunch. <laughs> it's like a nice <laughs> little lunch timer. Yeah. Very nice. Hi, this is James Swanick, and we're taking applications for our 90 day and one year stop drinking programs. Clients are mostly executives, entrepreneurs, and investors who have tried unsuccessfully and repeatedly to stop drinking but remain stuck in a frustrating cycle of stop start, stop start. Our programs are not AA, which has a reported 7% success rate. Our programs are not rehab, which has a reported 6% success rate. Our 90 day and one year programs involve a safe, fun, virtual community of high achievers with a process that boasts an incredible 92% success rate of clients reaching at least 90 consecutive days alcohol-free. We use the latest neuroscience and personal development processes to help rewire clients' brains around alcohol and minimize its importance in their lives. We will show you how to powerfully socialize with friends, family, and colleagues, what to say and how to say it so people don't mistakenly think that you're an alcoholic or have a problem and how to eliminate the temptation of returning to constant drinking so you can finally break the stop start cycle. To ensure client success, Project 90 can only accept 15 new clients each month. Some of those happy clients include John Keltner from California who said, I've lost 10 pounds. Susie Vaughn, a real estate broker in Tennessee who said, I've generated 20% more leads. Jessica Gaines Jarbo from Kentucky who says, I've now got joy, focus, presence and clarity. And Joe Worley from Michigan who says, my wife has the real Joe back. If you're an executive entrepreneur or investor who's sick of the stop start cycle and the damaging effects alcohol has on your health, happiness and family, and you're ready to regain confidence, become more present with your spouse and children, reduce stress, anxiety and irritability, sleep better, increase focus and productivity and feel better quickly, you're invited to apply to become a project. 90 client. Applicants can apply for an introductory interview by visiting alcoholfreelifestyle.com slash project 90. There's a link in the show notes, which you can just click, but that link is alcoholfreelifestyle.com slash project 90. Application interviews are limited and are conducted on a first come first served basis. If there are no remaining interview times available, wait a few weeks and try again. Let's get back to the show. So, as you moved along on this alcohol-free lifestyle journey, at some point you decided to make a little business out of this or to start posting some posts on social media or on TikTok or Instagram. Tell me 
Tell me at what point did you make this shift and go, actually, this is a long-term lifestyle thing for me now. This is not a short-term, I'm going to stop at 75 days or 100 days. This is a long-term thing. And now I'm actually going to share what I've learned with others. Um, So actually, I made a Facebook post way back in the day on after I hit 75 days. I got home from that vacation and I was finally like, you know, I'm going to share some of this. And it was because, too, I had seen so many friends on that trip that I hadn't seen in a while. And they kept saying, you look different. You look really good. What are you doing? And I finally said, well, I haven't been drinking. And I was finally making the clue like, okay, I'm, I'm, people are noticing from the outside now. They can tell the shift. So I finally put it out on Facebook and just said, I, I did one of those annoying posts. I did a thing. (laughs) I haven't been drinking for the past however many months. And, and I kind of celebrated my 75 days on Facebook and I was so afraid to post it. Because I was afraid of the judgment of the, oh, people are going to wonder why she quit. And, but I just framed it in this really positive way. And the, I received so much amazing feedback. And people just saying, that's so awesome. Or even some people saying, how would you do it? What would you do? Um, and then I just kind of kept posting the milestones on Facebook. Just I hit 100 days. I hit 150. And I would say the mental shift for me happened somewhere between 100 days and 150 that I wasn't drinking anymore. I I was done. I don't need alcohol anymore. I'm going to say never at this point. And I just kept it going. And then I think it must have been about six months into my journey. I asked friends, hey, if I put together a sober October group on Facebook, does anybody want to do it with me? And I had probably like 30 people join and it was was to just friends and family. And it was amazing. And I have people that still did that original Sober October group that say, I still haven't drank since we did that group together. So thank you so much. You like changed my outlook on this. And slowly I kept doing these groups and I started seeing this is something people can use. This is the same. This can propel people into an alcohol-free life if that's what they're looking for. And then I've slowly recorded my videos and put together an alcohol-free course for people. And I actually just revamped all of it because it's been a while. So I actually just re-recorded all of the videos and put together a workbook with it that goes with the 30-day alcohol-free challenge. So it was a slow evolution of me slowly coming out onto Facebook as a non-drinker and then deciding, you know what, enough people are benefiting from hearing my story that I'll keep sharing it. Mm. Amazing. And what was there any demographic of person who was watching and digesting your content that surprisingly reached out to you and spoke about what they were drinking and their desire to want to stop? Like was it was it was there any demographic that surprised you? I won't say that surprised me, but it was definitely moms right around my age, so in their late 30s, mm. early 40s, kind of saying the same thing. Like I'm I'm stuck in a rut. I'm I'm feeling really frustrated. This has become too much of a habit. That was the thing that I kept hearing from people. And definitely people saying, I love your posts because they're really positive. They focus on all of the benefits of quitting drinking instead of this scare tactic. Instead of this, drinking is going to ruin your life. If you keep drinking, this will happen. And instead, I was really focused on the, because I'm not drinking, this is happening. Because I'm not drinking, this is happening. So I think mainly in the beginning, it was women my age, but now I'm always surprised. I have quite a bit of men that join me too. Cause I know in the beginning I was like, Oh, I'm just going to help moms, busy moms. And Mm. now I have men reach out and go, do you work with men too? And I'm like, yeah, it's probably about half of my, (laughs) half of my members and half of my clients are men. men, So. Mm. Do you think that alcohol's reputation is taking a beating in recent years? Yes, I definitely. And I always wonder, too, if it's because I'm on the other side now, um, where it's kind of almost that feeling of how what cigarettes went through when people were finally like, these are really bad for you. We've got to stop smoking them all the time. We've got to put warnings on them. And um, I kind of wonder if that's happening now or if it's more just that I'm on the other side. So I see that positivity more because we're about to have the Super Bowl here in America. and. Everybody, if one person and one of my clients said, they said there's going to be more alcohol ads than ever this year. And I was just like, man, that's kind of crazy because I do feel like so many people are starting to talk about the negative effects of alcohol and the truth about alcohol. Yeah. 
by the time this episode comes out, the, the Super Bowl would have happened. My understanding yeah. is that um, there is a Heineken Zero ad going to make a run. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That'll be exciting. That's what I've heard. But at you, the listener, as you're listening to this, you probably already know whether it happened or whether it didn't happen. But we're recording it just a couple of days before the actual game. So, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's going to happen. So I think so too. That I'm could like, be that's a big what I keep hoping. Mm. Yeah, to have that shift and have it not be this. And more bars are starting to have non-alcoholic drinks, and I mean, and not just you order your cranberry juice and club soda now actually heineken 0.0 is becoming such a a staple sometimes it's Mm. the only option but you know i'll take that over (laughs) nothing yeah yeah i you know it's funny because i'm in uh, as we're recording this i'm in a little town called venezia which is about two hours outside of medellin in colombia middle of colombia just think of the most antiquated old little town little village kind of thing i think there's is it 13,000 people live in the, the the surrounding areas it's nothing it's you know it's not even half of a football stadium that live in this town and surrounding areas right there's a store that sells Heineken zero wow it's that's amazing pretty amazing it is pretty amazing i think i mean it's kind of like uh they've got a local brand here called Aguila a g a g u i l a and you can get Aguila 0.0s as well and Heineken Zeros and Aguilas, they sell them th- in some places in Medellin, in the city. But I was really shocked to see them sell Heineken Zero in a tiny little tienda, which is like a supermarket. or well, not even a supermarket, a market, like a tiny little market. Mm-hmm. They were selling them. They had three cans of this Heineken Zero. I'm like, man, what the hell is 0% alcohol doing in a tiny little village in the middle of Colombia? So you know it's it's happening like there's this cultural shift that is happening slowly but surely and i i had a video that went viral on social media recently i think it's up to as we're recording this now the video has 5 million views on tiktok and 2 million views on instagram so it's 7 million views between those two channels alone and the video starts with um alcohol's reputation is crumbling and then the video goes on to say that more and more people are turning their back on alcohol and here's why millennials have never drunk less and uh, we're going to look back in 20 years at alcohol with the same level of disdain that we currently look upon cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And it seems to have struck a chord. I mean, I can't get into the minds of 7 million people who saw it, but my hypothesis is that the idea that alcohol's reputation is taking a beating is a uh, is starting to to gather speed and there seems to be a cultural shift where people are now choosing alcohol free alternatives and that alcohol isn't now considered the cool trendy desirable thing that it has been for for decades do you yeah. share that sentiment i definitely do like i i really think it's going to become for like my kids, it's going to become, you know, their parents drug. It's going to be like, I can't believe my parents drank alcohol so regularly. And, you know, my parent, my kids won't personally think that because I quit early enough, but I definitely think it's becoming more of the, what, which generation gen X it's the gen X's thing. It's no longer the millennials thing. And it's definitely not the gen Z thing. It's just, it really is becoming Mm. looked at in a whole different way. And I think it's, really cool and there's so many amazing non-alcoholic brands coming out that are started by younger people that are started by 20 somethings and when they share their story of i was tired of hanging out with people who were just getting wasted but i also wanted to hang out with people and not feel like an outcast so i created this non-alcoholic wine or this non-alcoholic prosecco it's just it's it's a really cool shift and i live in a really small Mm. town and we actually have a huge selection of non-alcoholic beer because we were looking at it today and I was kind of shocked. It was like actually three, three shelves in this little cooler of non-alcoholic beer. And I'm like, that's wild. Cause we're mm. in a town of like a hundred. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Amazing. Do you drink at the alcohol free alter- alternatives? I don't very often. I, I do, but I mostly, gosh, we drink a lot of kombucha and, um, and a lot of just tonic water with lime mm. just, or, and then just the really boring LaCroix and, <laughs> 
mm-hmm. fizzy waters. But mm-hmm. yeah, the non-alcoholic beers just don't, I didn't drink them early on because they were kind of triggering to me when I had one. And that was really early on in my journey. And then I had them later and I only want like half of one. It's kind of like I drink them now and go, yeah, that's not that good, which is mm. crazy because I was totally a beer drinker. Mm. Yeah. I, I remember a year a year ago, I had my first alcohol-free beer. I decided to taste it. And when I was sitting down about to drink it, I thought, I checked, I maybe checked four or five times. This is alcohol free, right? Alcohol free, alcohol free. Yeah. 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 And then in my mind, I'm like, well, hang on. Is having an alcohol free beer actually having a beer? Or am I like, is this me breaking my record by having an alcohol free drink here? And I was so conflicted. And in the end, I decided it wasn't because it's not alcohol. You know, I stopped drinking alcohol. There's no alcohol in it. It just tastes like something. And to, to your point, I was, there was part of me was thinking, well, could this be triggering by, like, is, is, have I now just replaced uh, – the, the concern was, well, now am I going to really seek out alcohol-free be, alcohol free beers every night and drink two or three of those every night and think that that's okay, which probably it, it's 100 times more okay than if you're drinking it with alcohol in it, but you're still yeah. drinking some dead cal- calories nonetheless, right? And maybe then – you get so used to drinking alcohol-free beers that it's easy for you then to suddenly go, oh, I'll just have an alcoholic beer. So that was a that was a concern. But I thought in the in the um all things considered, uh I'd best, you know, given that this is a real trend, I'd best at least try some of these things, um, alcohol-free drinks, so I can speak confidently on the topic. And so I did. And, you know, surprisingly, the beer's pretty good. I mean, it's it's pretty good. Yeah. And I've had some Heineken Zeros and I've tried the Aguila Zeros and things like that. But, you know, I'm just, I have them on occasion. I'm not, uh, I'm not seeking them out. But now I'm now because I, I, my, my reticular activating system is now zoned in. I start every time I go into a supermarket now and I, I cross the fridge where the, that section is, I can go, oh, I, th- there's an alcohol free drink there. Wow. Yep. Look at this. This is really gathering speed now. So, I had the same thing with a non-alcoholic wine. I tried a Mm. red wine and it tasted exactly like what I remember red wine to taste like. But I also, when we were pouring it, I kept going, I don't even think I want it. Like it was very, it was this resistance. And it was also because I don't really like the taste of wine. I never really liked Mm. the taste of wine. I liked the, I liked the alcohol in wine. I liked to get drunk. Mm. So I was like, was I a wine drinker? Yes, a hundred percent. It felt like it was classy, so it was okay, even though I drank the cheapest wine I could find. <laughs> but it's like when I had the red wine, I was kind of like, I don't want this. Now we just have three more cans hanging out in our pantry waiting. And I'm like, my husband had one yesterday with lunch, which I thought was the strangest thing, which I kept being like, but it's it's the whole, like, it's still wine. because it, and it, But it's like, we're trying to get it out of the pantry space now. But I'm like, I don't know. It is, it's a, it's a, it's a strange thing to navigate and I never quite know what to tell people when they're asking like, well, can I have it? I'm like, it's always up to you. It's a hundred percent up to you, but it's, I don't know if that made sense at all. Well, I, when people ask me when they're stopping drinking, I say, look, strictly speaking, you're not drinking alcohol, but for the time that you're going through this mind rewiring process to stop drinking, I just invite you not to drink even the alcohol free yeah. versions. You know, let's just get used to being without it. And then, you know, if you get if you feel like you've conquered alcohol, then it's okay to probably have a few of these alcohol-free drinks on occasion. But like you don't want to be just so dependent on on something. You'd rather something, exactly. Mm. All right. Well, great conversation. Thank you so much, Sarah. Where can our listener find more information about you? Um, you can find me on TikTok under No More Wasted Days, and that's with an underscore between each word, and then Instagram, and also on YouTube. And I'm on Facebook too. I'm on all the socials, I guess. And it's all No More Wasted Days, right? Yes. Yeah. No underscore more underscore wasted underscore days. Sarah Kaufman Bradstreet, thank you so much for sharing your guidance and expertise and your story with us. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me. 
Hi there, this is James Swanick. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I would be so grateful if you would leave a review. That will help us climb the rankings and get our show exposed to so many more people who could really benefit from the content. You can do that by going into Apple Podcasts, rating the show, writing a little one sentence summary and posting it. That would be so amazing. Thank you. Likewise, if you would like to schedule a 15 minute exploratory call and apply for our Project 90 program, then you can do so by going to alcoholfreelifestyle.com slash project 90. If you'd like to get the free guide, that is the alcohol freedom formula guide, you can go to alcoholfreelifestyle.com slash guide. Our YouTube channel is at alcoholfreelifestyle.com slash YouTube. You can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at at James Swanick. Thank you so much for listening. We so appreciate you and we'll catch you on the next one.